We are in the midst of a revolution, <laughs> an agricultural one. Let me explain why. My dad built this house. My brother and I grew up in it. My mom still lives in it. But this century, it will be gone. Like many houses on the coast of South Carolina and coasts around the world, it's going to be swallowed up by excess sea level rise caused by excess CO2 in the atmosphere. There is too much seawater and there's too much CO2. So what if we could create a machine that would take in seawater and take in CO2 and output fresh water, food, jobs, habitat? I have good news. One already exists. It's called a halophyte. These salt-tolerant plants evolved millions of years ago in the saltiest, saltiest places of Earth where there was no competition from other plants. They thrive on seawater. We need to scale them up. Our ancestors created the first agricultural revolution by taking seeds from plants that grow with fresh water, giving them good soil, and breeding them, and scaling it up into the farms that fed all of us today. But tomorrow, there will be 350,000 new mouths to feed. 350,000! There will be less fresh water to do it with. There will be less arable land to do it with. There will be more seawater. There's going to be more CO2. We need a second agricultural revolution, this time based on Earth's largest resource, seawater. I was so captivated by this idea a few years ago, I grabbed seeds from some of the native salt-tolerant plants in South Carolina and set out on a mission. Experiment one. So I took the seeds and I put them in what are called confined disposal facilities. They exist all over the harbor and other harbors in the world. Every time we deepen our river to make room for bigger ships, we put the mud in a confined space, the water evaporates, and you're left with a salty desert. You've probably seen some on the way here. The plants started growing, and they were looking healthy. But we realized very early on, you do not, do not want to eat food off of these spaces. They're filled with petroleum and heavy metals and plastics and all the stuff that humans create. Experiment one was a failure. It's okay, back to the drawing board. Experiment two, this time, took the seeds and I planted them along the intertidal zone where they naturally exist. Seawater agricultural revolution would be harmonious with nature. But within a few weeks, high tides, heavy winds, washed all the seeds away. Experiment two was a failure. So I said, okay, let's pump the seawater onto land where we can control the tides. And the plants started to grow and they looked healthy and they were growing and they were still looking healthy. And in May, we got our first harvest and chefs bought it, collected the first check, started a company. And in June, the water got so salty and hot that all the plants died. <laughs> when I went to restart that experiment, the seasons had been changing, and the plants started to flower. And when plants flower, they become inedible. I said, that's OK. I asked the, the landowner, can I use your space uh, next year? And he said, uh, no, Sam, I'm, I'm going to develop it. Experiment three was a failure. It was close. So at that point, I had gotten into graduate school with this idea, like, I really can turn seawater and CO2 into food. But I didn't get a thesis committee. They, they didn't think that this idea was, was workable. It was a little bit pie in the sky. But that's OK, because one professor gave me the keys to his lab and let me run with it. And what I found was that. Many, many of the outdoor 
seawater agriculture projects had failed for the same three reasons mine had just failed, a land use constraint. If you want to do seawater agriculture, you must be near the coast. People live near the coast. The land's expensive. And so you put your seawater farm in a deserted place near the coast, but when you pump seawater, the water evaporates and you built up salt. And even these plants can't take salt and their yields start to go down in those quantities. And the third, seasonality. The seasons control when these plants flower, that becomes bad for agriculture and makes it hard to control. So I said, okay, let's take these plants vertically. That way there's no land use constraint. We can do it in the city. Let's replace the sun with light and that way there is no seasonality. And let's let software monitor, manipulate the salinity and we won't build up salt. And the plants started to grow and we harvested them and they sold and we did it again. We harvested them, they sold. Investors joined and we built a team. And last year, that team built the world's first vertical salt water farm. We, Experiment four was a success. We showed it was possible. You can take CO2 and seawater, and you can output healthy food, healthy salt, fresh water, jobs. Our first product is now in 40 states. 40. But there's a catch. The products of vertical farming are expensive. Not that many people could join us in the agricultural revolution. So it's back to the drawing board. Can we find a way to do this out of doors at a low cost and make a global impact? And we found one. You see, all along the coasts of Asia, there are rice paddies, and many of those rice paddies are becoming salinized for the same reason that I'm going to lose the family home. Three rice harvests per year have become two, or one, or the farmers have left. <laughs> so we got the Ministry of Agriculture in Bangladesh to find four farmers who were crazy enough to let me and a couple others come onto their land and plant these salt tolerant plants and it worked. We took salt out of the soil and into the plants. Those farmers had a new crop to sell at the market and in the next season their rice yields went back up. Wow. We had four farmers that year. This year there's 40. Wow. Next year 400. Wow. We are descended from creatures which crawled out of that salty primordial soup called the ocean. And now we're going to turn back to it as the resource which will sustain our species for the next few centuries. But let's pause. Remember that when our ancestors created the first agricultural revolution, they did it with good intentions. And yet those methods are now responsible for most of the world's land loss, deforestation, biodiversity loss, fresh water loss. This second agricultural revolution has to be different. It, it cannot put profits over the planet. It has to... It has to stay true to a few principles which have been happening in the last nine minutes of this talk, okay? Water from the Atlantic Ocean is being taken up through this plant, and the salt and the nutrients are being left behind. 
the fresh water is being released. The CO2 in that cup has been going like this. It happens every time. We just have to keep to these simple principles. If you take seawater and CO2 and give it light and a plant, a correct plant that is salt tolerant, every single time, salt is extracted. Carbon is captured. Fresh water is released. Food is grown. 